systems and we're actually doing a flyby. So this will, like a lightning round, it's gonna move extremely fast. Um, there's two types of basic programming. There's procedural based programming, typically found in languages like C, Power Basic, QBasic. And then there's object oriented, which breaks up the code into easily viewed parts. Um, for example, Steve Jobs as part of his next initiative was the ones that was really the first to really commercially use, although object oriented program has been around for a while. And you've used probably, if you've done any kind of VBS scripting, you've used, um, you've used these objects. So for example, in VBS, if you ever use the file scripting object, then you basically use these things called objects. And here's an example of procedural. So I just have a function at the top, and then let's just say I call the procedure. And with object oriented, I can create classes, I can create data around the classes, and metadata around the objects. And you'll hear a lot of people talk about object oriented, and that's basically they use these objects. But you can really think about objects, um, when we talk about object oriented programming, we talk about writing classes and those type things. But if you think about it, really with PowerShell and all these other languages, if you think about tools like Xcopy, Copy, Dell, NetSH, and all those things, kind of view those as objects that are available to you. So there are metadata and their tools that are available to you um, to perform a certain task. Another thing you'll need to know when you start looking at development is there's basically three methods of execution. So um, you could argue the last two would be combined in one. One is compile code or executable code that you would run, and the other would be interpreted and then the third would be a just-in-time compile. And this is very similar to .NET, which basically compiles to this Microsoft intermediate language. So basically what's turned out in Microsoft is there's two types of applications now. There's basically you're in Manage, which is native EXE with native calls to the operating system. And then there's this Manage just-in-time. Well, the dangerous part of this is, is that when you write a dot app, most people don't know this, but the .NET code can easily be brought into a decompiler and you can actually view the actual source code. In fact, most of your third party vendors, you can actually um, use a tool from Redgate um, that'll actually let you see all the code. So like for example, Citrix often skates none of their code. So I can almost look at all of their code um, and trace bugs and so forth. So if you're a commercial developer and you're writing tools in .NET and you're worried about IP, this could be a concern. There's big players in the market, so when you really start writing an app, um, and I really wanted to expose you to different types of applications today and different types of tiers. Um, so there's really some big players here. So Delphi, C++ Builder was all built on VCL, and back in the day, Delphi owned like 80% of the application market what I mean like user exposed apps. Um, what's cool about this is that .NET was actually based on VCL. The guy that actually um, did VCL uh, actually went over to .NET and I've got tons of VCL ex um, experience. And they've actually ported it now over to FireMonkey so you can actually take a lot of these objects that are available that follow Delphi and the C++ stuff and you can compile it to Android, iOS. Um, of course Visual Studio has been around since the 80s. Um, I put PB on here because it's a consultant secret weapon. Um, it's a compiler that has a six kilobyte runtime, so you can actually compile a Windows executable that is six kilobytes in size, and it still fits on a floppy disk. It's called the consultant secret weapon, I will tell you. Um, for me, over the past 22 years, it's gotten me out of so many jams, and I'm actually talking about a little bit about it, like for one slide tomorrow in my automation when I'm going over how do you automate all these processes. Um, Java, of course, which came out in 1995, is multi-platform. So if you have to have your app run on Linux and other platforms, um, Java is a great thing. WX widgets um, and Qt is another C++ type environment. You'd be surprised how many of your commercial apps are written in this today. And of course there's .NET and various other languages inside of them. There's tons of popular IDEs, so each language will have its own popular IDE, each with their own. Um, so here's a Java, this is the Eclipse IDE here. This is a VCL ID here. So one of the things that most people don't realize as a developer is that your job of a developer is really to write as little code as possible now. Um, time has shifted where you really wanted to put on your chest and say, look at all this code I wrote. What you really want to do is be using objects and you want to focus more on the business project you're solving at hand, um, not really letting your ego get the best of you and saying, look at all this code that I wrote. So your true job so if you have an application and you've got a user interface, you've got graphics, you have to send and receive data from the server, um, you know, there's a lot of things when you bring an application to market that I don't think a lot of people 
taken mine. I mean, sometimes you may see a developer's code and it's 10 or 20 lines and you think, why am I paying all this money for this? Well, you're paying all this money for this because it's QA'd, it's been tested. There's a lot of time that goes into just writing a script and then making sure that you're logging everything so if there are errors, the user can know what those errors are, handling exceptions so it doesn't crash the system. And just kind of keep in mind that um, literally like 10 lines of code can take days to bring to the market by the time you package it up, test it, and go through a whole rigorous cycle. So objects, like we said, you want to write as few things as possible. So there's literally thousands of objects and it almost just gets so confusing. So instead of you writing all this code, I mean, you can go out and buy, a lot of these are free, like logging. There's several logging libraries that are free. There's commercial ones. There's database objects, objects to parse XML, objects to do user interface. And a lot of companies sell these components. In fact, a lot of the commercial components and a lot of the applications that you use, they're leveraging these components from these vendors. They, they go out and they buy it. So for example, here's a report designer with no code whatsoever. So this, this company, they sell a report designer. Um, some of the larger component manufacturers, so if you want to check them out, in software, so if you're doing data, TCP, IP, Telnet, all kind of data transport, you can use um, in software objects. DevExpress is huge in the VCL and the ASP.NET for logging. Gurok software to me is the bar none for logging and I'll actually show how to integrate that with PowerShell tomorrow. Um, component source, you can kind of browse and look for components. If you're writing C++ code jock, Infragistix is a really cool, um, they have a lot of great um, .NET tools for doing data analysis and um, TMS software is another really cool company. So here's some, for example, here, TMS for, and they sell, TMS sells all kind of really cool controls, but they've released this cloud pack. So rather than you having to go look at all the Dropbox APIs, they've done it, they put it in an object for you, and then you just use it, and they have all these cloud packs. So you can actually write all these Windows apps that interface with the cloud, or write an ASP.NET cloud using their cloud pack. So almost all of your developers out there and all your companies, they are using these objects, they're not writing all this code yourself. They're they're adding the code that they need to to support their app. Here's an example of some. Here's some spin buttons and mask you can purchase. So let's just quickly talk about why would you write in .NET. Um, .NET is a, obviously a great development platform for Microsoft. It's an enormous library of third-party components, so if you're looking for that, it's a rapid application environment. It's got great community support. It's got great logic and workflow in it. There's tons of these objects that you can go out and buy. And I'm gonna tell you, if you're looking for sexy, where you're doing dashboards and it needs to look good to the user, .NET's got you covered. Because there's tons of just really objects that really make it um, a great platform there. Again, it's a platform, it's not, not a language, because you can write in C Sharp and VB.NET. Java is both a platform and a language. It is object oriented. It's highly scalable, so it scales out really well. Again, it's multi-platform. However, a lot of your end users, if you've seen Java apps, you'll define them as, some people define them as quirky. They just don't feel sometimes like um, other apps. Basic, so basic is um, a spoken language. It was my first language on the Apple II. It's very easy to read and it's very easy to pick up. So if you're learning for the first time, basic's probably a language that you may wanna um, look at. C Sharp, again, 80% of all applications on the market, if you look at all applications outside of Windows and everything, are written in C++, which is my language of choice. Um, C Sharp is C-like, so if you already have a C++ background, it's pretty easy to port over, and it is a standard language for .NET. For scripting, again, I think we all know um, VBScript, PowerShell, and there's also a language out there called WinBatch that you can actually compile. Um, Windows executables and they have got like 4,000 functions that you can call so WinBatch is kind of a cool one. So I'll put up here if you're writing system applications C++, C Sharp probably is a language for you. If you're wanting to do system automation then C Sharp, PowerShell, VBS, WinBatch may be some languages for you. If you're wanting to write Windows applications you may want to look at a console app or a Windows app or maybe base your app off Windows presentation framework which is kind of not really a web framework, but kind of replaces Windows Forms. And then keep in mind now that when you write web-based applications, you can use other objects. So you can use Google Maps, 
They have a published API, Amazon, Facebook. For web-based, there's basically three main t um, platforms for Windows. Um, there's ASP, which is the first, which basically was clear text. There's ASP.net, which has replaced ASP. And a lot of, as we know now, a lot of websites are written on HTML5. What platform you choose as a developer and what platform your product is written in really depends on what protocols you want to do, what you're trying to solve, how other users will interface with you. Does it need to be web-based, Windows-based? Is speed an issue? And I wanted to show this too, so like here's an object here, so and there's all these different protocols like we talked about before, so like SOAP is a protocol, um, XML is not really a protocol, but XPath is, so XPath you can, you know, here's an example of an XML file, and I kind of like with SQL, I can send a query and say, show me all books that are greater than $35, I can send this, and it'll actually return to me back XML, which I can parse as a developer, and I can quickly get this information, so a lot of these things data parsing and stuff really happens very quickly. You may have heard terms um, before when you start talking um, with a lot of your vendors. You may have heard um, jQuery and Ajax. So I wanted to tell you quickly what they are. So as you're scrolling here and maybe you click on something and something hovers over or you're typing your password and it comes up strong, um, that's done by jQuery. And jQuery is a technology that um, it's really cool for this. It kind of does some server client communication. If you're on Facebook and you click like and the whole web page doesn't refresh, all that's done by Ajax. If you're building interactive applications and you don't want to rely on plugins, if you choose an HTML browser, then you actually can write full applications like games and apps in your browser. Um, so in the, in the future, you'll see um, Things like ICA, RDP, VMware, these companies already have that where they're doing it natively right in the browser. So when you put it all together, here's an example. Maybe I wanted to write an HTML5 front-end application that the user sees, but on the back end, it might be an ASP.NET app, which would basically be a web-based interface, and that ASP.NET might be composed of DLLs that make RESTful API calls, which we didn't really get to talk about, but RESTful is just a protocol for how you can aggregate data on the web. I might make some data and I might get some data back in XML. Or I might just want to write a basic Windows form apps in C Sharp that talks to an ASP.NET web server. One of the things you'll find is like, why do you want to want to learn about development? Well, when you learn about development, one of the things you'll do is you'll begin to understand better how things work. I can't tell you just being like a C++ developer that it's really, it makes it really easy to debug a lot of Windows applications and a lot of Windows issues just because I know a lot of the APIs that are being done. So it, it will dramatically reduce your troubleshooting times and you may find the irritation with your vendor may increase because you may know more sometime when you call them than they do. Um, so I found that. So in conclusion, what's next for you? If you want to learn about like core Windows, how it works, um, C Sharp or C++ would be great for you. If you want to learn about writing device drivers, then I would recommend using the Windows Driver Kit and C++. If you're wanting just to develop like Windows apps, like Windows Store apps, then C Sharp, WinRT, or VB.net would be for you. If you're wanting to write web apps, look at ASP.net. If you're wanting to automate, of course, PowerShell, VBS. If you need cross-platform, then Java, Delphi, C++ Builder, there's tons of other cross-platform technologies. Of course, if you're mobile, Apple has Objective-C, um, Java for Android. I would encourage you to learn some basic data types if you're really going to go down the development standpoint. Learn about integers, what um, D words are, keywords, which are basically Win API data types. And believe it or not, you may just in .NET, if you ever code anything, you just use the word string. There's so many types of string. There's Unicode strings, UTF-8 strings, dynamic strings. It's something you probably would want to um, learn about. And learn really how to um, data parse using some technology like regular expressions. I'll leave you with this slide. The biggest challenge for you, and the biggest challenge for you starting down if you're new, especially if you're new to development, is not going to be learning the language. Most of these things have a very, outside of, I'd say, C-sharp and C++, which has a lot of intercourse with the language. 
um, the language is going to be really easy. I mean, PowerShell only has a certain number of syntaxes that you can do. But learning how to use all the objects that are available to you, because there's literally thousands, um, can dramatically decrease your um, time required to do the app and can also um, decrease your complexity. So, all right, hope that helped. And that was a lot of information. Down arrows. Okay. Okay. Let me know when to start. <coughs> Hello, everyone. I'm uh, Srini Gurapu. I'm the founder and CEO uh, at Wheel Innovations. What I'm going to talk about today is a new uh, network centric approach to managing native email app on the mobile devices. Very specifically, we're going to talk about a secure proxy cache approach uh, to manage and secure your email. A quick introduction about our team. We're a bunch of uh, geeks, experts, or uh, with deep background in network security and uh, desktop and application virtualization. And that's the reason why we are able to uh, achieve or at least make an attempt at what we are doing. So what's really happening in the, in the enterprise? If I look at the enterprise, there are two fundamental shifts that are happening. On one end, on the end user side, you know, we all know the term BYOD. It's all about enabling the end users to bring their personal mobile devices, whether it's iPads or Android tablets or the, or the smartphones, to actually access the business services. And the second trend, what I refer to as BYOS, bring your own service. Some people jokingly refer to that as bring your own shit. And this is about <laughs> moving your data center, whatever you used to uh, run your uh, business service like the email, CRM, and so on and so forth, pretty much every organization has a strategy to move into the cloud, whether it's a public cloud or a, pub, uh, a SaaS, SaaS service or a, or a public cloud. So what that really means, it means that organizations no longer own the infrastructure end-to-end, -end, whether it could be the device or the, the infrastructure to run the business service, where the infrastructure is owned by somebody else. But you as an organization, you're still responsible for the secure delivery of these services end to end. And in this new world, the apps, the mobile apps are becoming the gateway to consume all the services. And if you look at the chart to the right, you know, there is an interesting statistic about what are people doing with the mobile devices. Apps dominate the browser by a great extent. Apps have become the gateway to the services. And if you look at the apps you know, deeper, what are these apps doing? Apps are actually using HTTP, this is the network protocol, to actually access this service with sync. Fundamentally, sync has become the lifeline to enable the both online and offline experience. Very succinctly, what it means is when you have the network, app connects to the business service, it gives you the latest information, and when you're offline, it gives you whatever is available on the device. And that's the fundamental, frame, uh, fundamental uh, capability or the behavior that we use to build uh, this proxy technology. So what exactly is the problem with the nat managing native email on the mobile devices? Jack Madden wrote an excellent article uh, on uh, brianmadden.com in February of uh, uh, this year where he summarized the three different approaches that organizations are using to manage the native mail. And, and this is also something uh, Jack reiterated, reiterated today in the morning session about enterprise uh, mobility. So the, the need is 
how can I securely manage and deliver mail, contacts, calendar, and attachments on the personal mobile devices? That's the BYOD problem. And the three options are number one, lock the entire device. I mean, this is using some MDM, which we all know it's not the BYOD strategy. And the second one is the middle ground, where you don't worry about the calendar contacts and the actual mail contents, but only secure the attachments using some kind of an attachment encryption. So that's the middle road, but it doesn't give you the full solution. And the third one, which is actually a lot of enterprises are actually using, which is like just abandon the native app completely and introduce a new app. And this is, you know, started with, you know, good technologies with the good email app, and then uh, Nitro does Touchdown and Citrix and every organization is trying to build it parallel email client, which I fundamentally disagree with. And, and this is actually, um, you know, uh, more so true with the latest iOS 7, where Apple has invested a lot more resources in enhancing the native mail experience with smart folders and, and things like that. And this is with the native email. And what's happening with other native apps? You know, if you go to the App Store today, you have a box application. But for an enterprise use case, you have a box good edition. In other words, box application rewritten with good technologies, SDK, and something else. And you know, if, you, if I'm an organization, if I use some other MDM technology, then I have another variant of box you know, uh, for my own use. Essentially, we are creating a parallel universe of applications because native applications cannot be managed for the enterprise use. This, I, I think, you know, is fundamentally not the right trend, creating parallel universe of the apps. But at the same time, you know, security and the manageability is a, is a requirement. And um, so if you look at uh, this, what can be done, you know, there has always been this you know, big struggle uh, or uh, you know, war between the endpoint and the application community versus the network community. The application, the endpoint community always you know, think that networks are nothing but dumb pipes. They should just provide the connectivity. All the security and the management should be within the application on the device. And then, you know, from my experience at working at the networking companies, they all think that, you know, application guys should just focus on the business uh, need. They should deliver, the, uh, deliver this to email or any other functionality. Let us actually handle all the security and other, you know, management stuff, all the intelligence. So there's always this, you know, two different camps, you know, that always, you know, try to fight on we are big and you know, you're big. But what is actually needed in the market is, is an integrated approach. It's not about endpoint or the network. It's about bringing the app intelligence into the network, thereby you can uh, meet the customer requirements. So now let's look at you know, what we have actually done with the native email. So what you see is uh, you know, taking the native email app on the iOS device, and then you have the active sync server that could be running in your data center, or you could be connecting to some service like an Office 365. So we built a secure proxy cache technology, and that is what you see in the middle. And that proxy cache, you could run it on the network external to the device, or you could also run it on the, on the device itself, local cache. And at essentially, at a concept level, what the secure cache is doing is, it's actually watching all the mail, calendar contacts that are actually flowing through the proxy between the mail app and the, uh, and the server, and it's making some smart decisions. So if you, how many of you know ActiveSync protocol? Good. So if you look at the ActiveSync protocol, so what the email app does is you know, it actually generates you know, a bunch of commands, you know, ping to figure out you know, if there is a new update, and then it has some uh, you know, sync commands, you know, folder sync, sync, get attachment. The, you know, if you go to the MSDN article, it's a 300-page you know, document you know, of, the, of the ActiveSync protocol. So, that's a way to actually go download all the mail and calendar on the contacts and then keep it in sync. So when, when the mail server receives those commands, it basically responds with the appropriate mail content or the calendar item or contact item or the attachments and, and, and the state. So what we are doing is we take what the server sends back and then we basically modify the content so that native app can deliver it without maintaining any state. And that way, you get the full manageability and the security while the end users get the benefit of using the native experience. No longer you don't have to go to another contacts app to actually get the corporate contacts or another email app. You can actually enable the native mail experience. 
So I listed some of the capabilities on what can actually be done by being a network only, uh, network only device. So I've actually broken this into two lists. One is what are the things that you could do by being an external network proxy, in other words, with no footprint on the device. So number one, what you could do is within the mail app, when people actually can go to um, the accessing the corporate email, you could actually control when they have access to all the calendar contacts and email and attachments. When their BYOD session is ended, you can completely erase all the state without actually having to do any external stuff. So that we refer to as a purge. And the second one is, uh, you know, attachment rewriting. I mean, this is very similar to what uh, Jack referred to as the middle ground in his article. And um, the third one is uh, some customer said, you know, we need to be able to have the emails. Like, for example, eBay, when they send an email, that email contains a link to approve the purchase order, which actually points to your internal server. So we can actually rewrite the web links so that you, we can make those links active. And we can actually do more calendar filtering on the contact filtering so that the native app gets the bare minimum information. The additional information, actually the details of the calendar, you could only access it through the secure cache. So there are other uh, capabilities. Um, in the interest of time, I'm gonna switch to doing a live demo. But the key concept is without actually having any software running on the device, you can do a lot of stuff. And by running the proxy on the device, you can actually do all these things in both online mode and offline mode. So that means even when you're on the airplane, you can get the, get the uh, capabilities. Now, let me do a quick, uh, quick demo. And for this, I need to uh, project my iPad. seem to have, uh, okay, good, good. Does anyone have a, an iPad project? Oh. It's me. So slides are Never interesting until you actually see the live demo. Okay, good. So uh, very quickly, when you go here, uh, this is my native mail app. You know, we haven't jailbroken the device or anything. This is a regular iPad. If you go to my Gmail, you will see the regular email. And you go to Yahoo, you see the regular email, but when you actually go to the corporate email, it basically says, sorry, you cannot access your corporate mail or contacts until you log into the app top, which is a proxy. For this demo, we are actually running the proxy on the device. So what do you do? Um, and before you do that, I also want to show you that there are no corporate contacts here. Okay. So now, let me actually launch the app top. It's actually connecting to a uh, cloud service. Uh, that's uh, hosted on Rackspace. And let me log in with my uh, AD credentials. And once the authentication is successful, the app top is nothing but you know, a secure container for all your enterprise apps and data. So it's actually provisioning your entire apps and data services that you are entitled to. If you actually go to the email stuff, it actually delivers all the, the corporate email. Okay, so it's only when you are authenticated. And as I said here, if a link is actually come in the body of the email, this is automatically rewritten so that it actually is routed through our internal corporate gateway. If you see the address bar, it's not the www.cnn.com. It's actually going through our secure gateway. Now let me go back to the, the email 
And if there is an attachment, this is the middle ground approach. These attachments are rewritten and encrypted so that only Aptop can open it. So if you open it, if you try to open it in any other app, it doesn't work. And um, the, if you go back to your contacts, the, the contacts actually takes about ActiveSync server to, uh, uh, for about 30 seconds you know, for it to uh, send back the contacts. But if you go back to the, so these are the corporate contacts. That's actually delivered from the proxy. And you can actually go to the, the calendar stuff. Now it actually shows um, this is my exchange calendar, you know, by forum event and so on and so forth. A quick uh, demo of this stuff is now, let me go back and go back to the app top and then log out of my BYOD session. And you go to your email, it just has the regular email. Your email, contacts, and everything is restricted. And all the while, we have not actually touched any of the other, other functionalities. Let me do uh, one uh, 15 seconds and do a quick other demo. We can actually do even more advanced stuff. In the app top, let me enable uh, contact, advanced contact filtering and web rendering. And let me go back and uh, log into the app top session. So uh, what you see here is, you know, if you, uh, if you monitor the body of the email, you see as secured by Aptop. This is not actually a regular mail text. It's actually a webified object. And this is actually being served from the, from the cache. And uh, what this means is we have the ability to deliver it as a native email or we could even deliver it as a, a webified object without actually compromising any of the user experience. Everything else, you know, uh, stays the same. What is more interesting in this, uh, in this demo is uh, with your um, contacts, let me only show, it takes 30 seconds. Yeah, yeah. So that's pretty much the summary on all the capabilities, uh, you know, what we can do with the proxy, you know, secure cache approach where the goal is to enable the native mail app experience, and then uh, the admins get the full security and the manageability. Thank you so much. How's that? You hear me back there? Yeah. Good. All right, this is great. I get assistance this year. <laughs> this is nice. I like this. I've never actually done a Bry form without my own laptop. So Benny, Benny's been uh, uh, happy to uh, provide his. We threw, I only got a few slides on there, so. Um, and the slides aren't really all that important. This is really more about a conversation. Um, so my name is Tim Mangan, uh, Team Merchant Technology. I do a bunch of stuff with AtV. Um, and we're going to talk uh, a little bit about what's new in AtV. So last year I was here, uh, I gave a presentation on what was coming up in the AtV 5.0 uh, release. Uh, Microsoft had announced it uh, a little bit before the um, Chicago Bry form. And um, we were able to, uh, therefore, show it. Um, they actually had a, a beta that was out. Um, and that ended up getting released in November. So um, this is kind of the, the, the main platform. Uh, AppV 5.0 was a complete rewrite of the AppV product from the ground up. Um, if you want a lot of the details, obviously in 15 minutes, I can't do that. Um, I recently uh, pulled up the video. Brian put the uh, videos from last year's Bry forums out uh, available for free for everybody. He does that about a year after the, the event. Um, and I actually went back and looked at it 
uh, last month. And I was amazed I, uh, how much uh, I got right <laughs> in that presentation. Um, I, I, was, I was very impressed with myself uh, because I think I pretty much nailed the big changes that were in there. Uh, but, but basically, it's a complete rewrite of the stack. You know, when we wrote this product back in 2000, um, it was built for the Windows NT platform. You know, we had to support Windows NT and Windows 2000. Those were our, our target platforms for it. And we made a lot of design decisions back then based on the technology that was available. So lots of AppV customers have, have complained for years and years about the problem of having to have this Q drive, this virtual drive letter, that they had to have a drive letter that was available for every client machine in the entire company with the same drive letter. And trying to find one of those was always tough. And that was a result of the fact that in the Windows NT timeframe, uh, and the original uh, Windows 2000, the only way to present a file system in Windows was to give it a drive letter. You had to mount things at a drive letter. We don't have to do that now. We can mount things at a folder level and do lots of creative things. And that's what the, uh, the Microsoft team did. They spent three years rewriting this product from the ground up, taking a look and saying, okay, what do we need to do today? And what technologies are available? And then how do we go about do it? And what can we pull from the old code? And they actually didn't pull a whole lot as far as I've been able to tell. They really replaced all the components. We've got um, a, a whole new file system. It's no longer these uh, black holes that there are no tools to view or modify the contents in there, the old SFT format, and then the PKG format, which is even worse. I mean, that one took me about three years to reverse engineer the PKG format. Um, it was such a horrible, horrible format. I think the guy was on drugs when he wrote that. <laughs> um, but they, they kind of replaced, um, all of that stuff, new server, new client. Uh, the consoles are totally rewritten in this great new technology called Silverlight. <laughs> okay, I said they sent three years. Okay, I think that was an early decision. So, um, uh, so that's what happened. So they, funny story with this. Um, the, uh, the AppV MVPs got together and met with the development team last October. You know, we've been trying to get, we always meet with them in Redmond uh, which is weird because they're based in Boston, so they all have to fly out to, to Redmond uh, for the MVP Summit every year. And uh, last year we convinced them to let us come to Boston and meet you there. And, and let's just you know, have a, a little meeting and, and let's talk about 5.0. And at the opening of the meeting, they asked, went around the room and said, oh, you know, we'd like to, everyone to sort of state their goals when they're here. And I was the first one up and I said, you know, this is uh, September, right the last week of September. I said, you know, I know this 5.0 stuff is coming up. You're not telling us when you're gonna release it, but I can kind of guess that your normal release cycle for this product is always in like a January, February time frame, and that's probably what you're targeting. And I'm here today to tell you, I think you need more time, and you should set that back about six months. So we finished going through all the MVPs, and then the guy from Microsoft stood up and said, okay, we have our first announcement for you today. Uh, we got code complete on Friday, and we're announcing to you privately that the ship date is November 1st. Um, so they went and released it. Um, and we've been um, sort of taking a look at it, trying to get to know it better and better. Um, and there are some good things and bad things in terms of 5.0. I and mean, the first thing that's good is there's a lot of transparency. All of those hidden little black holes we had before are really gone. Uh, they've taken an approach that has said that basically, in the past, we over-isolated, and they want the apps to act more like native apps when they're virtualized. I mean, you still need to do a lot of funky things to these apps to do the virtualization, but we want them to act a little more naturally. Um, they've added in a lot of support for things that they've added for developers in terms of integrating their product to the user and the operating system and other applications over the years that we didn't have support for in AppV. In fact, some of them I didn't even know existed because they, just, they were never there in AppV and I never really noticed them. So there are things like um, app paths. You know how when an application wants to add paths into the path field, they change the path variable, right? Um, well, that's like really old technology now. It turns out they added something about six years ago called app paths, that the application can register extra paths to be used in its path variable, but only when that executable is running. So uh, when um, AutoCAD gets installed, rather than change the system path variable, they can just say 
AutoCAD.exe, here's the stuff that it needs. And it gets prepended in front of whatever the path variable is. So Appy 5 now supports this naturally in its publishing process. So there's a lot of stuff like that that came in that's really good. Um, not everything's good though. And the number one thing on my list that's not good is that AppV in the past has solved a lot of problems for customers with applications that don't behave the way they're supposed to in Windows today. So applications that would um, write uh, a uh, configuration file in the program directory, for example. AppV would capture that up, it would redirect it, and it would follow the user automatically as they went from machine to machine in a roaming profile environment. Well, in AppV 5.0, if the application tried to write that data, and it's a file, different than the case of the registry, in the case of a file, if it tried to write the data to a file that naturally wouldn't roam, then in AppV it's not going to roam either. It is isolated, it is redirected, but it's redirected to the user's app data local folder. We've been complaining about this, <laughs> um, and I don't, still don't know if they're going to do anything about that. Um, so it is different. So as a result of this, when 5.0 came out, um, up until around, I'd say, February or March, was the first time that I started got co comfortable talking to customers about, should I be going to AppV 5.0? And I reached the point, and previously, I was saying, you need to be playing with this and getting to understand it, because this is where you are going to end up going if you're going to do AppV, but don't go changing everything yet. Just stay with 4.6 for a while until we get to know this better, maybe when the first, you know, next release or service pack comes out, because this is like a dotto release. I mean, this was a complete rewrite. So you don't necessarily want to jump to it right away. We got around February, I started feeling a little more comfortably, and I changed the message. And my message at that point was, if you are an existing AppV customer, please wait for whatever it is that's coming next. You know, service pack, we don't know. Um, but wait for that. You're good where you're at. There's a lot of challenges that we still don't fully understand the platform. But if you're a new customer, I felt comfortable enough at that point to say, hey, you should go to AppV 5.0. Yeah, there's going to be some challenges there, but there's going to be challenges if you go to 4.6 too. And if you go to 4.6, I bet you in a year you'll be moving to 5.0 and then there's going to be additional challenges. So just go straight to 5.0. And I felt very comfortable with that. So then we got our first service pack. Okay, came out in the spring. And, uh, okay, it's, it's, it's a dog of a service pack, okay? It's a real snoozer, okay? That's why there's a snoozing dog there. I, I don't know why he has a tie on, okay? That's just the image I found. Um, they added support for language packs. Um, they fixed some of the things that they needed to do for virtualizing Office 2013. And they released a solution, which we didn't have until the service pack, to support um, Office uh, 2012 being virtualized as well. Now, I'm gonna tell you right now, I still don't recommend that anybody virtualize Office, okay? I'm not there yet. I may get there someday. Um, they've done a lot of really, really good stuff. Um, I've just, the experience over the years has been, we see a lot of really good stuff, and I see customers do it, and then they, about six months later, start to just really get pissed off that they did that. Oh, those separate little pieces like that? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, but Office is a platform, and there are just so many apps. And our experience has been that you know that you, if you do Office, you've got another 20 apps maybe in your company, depending on the size of the company, that are going to integrate with Office. And that's great, but the number's really more like 40. And as you start discovering those other ones, it's like you get to a point after about four or five months where every week something new pops up and you have to go back and address office again, and back and again, and after a while, the customer just says, hey, enough, let's just put it on the base image. You know, it, it worked for us in the past, so let's go that way. So, so that's what I would recommend, yeah, but uh, Visio, um, the plugins to office as well, I mean, perfectly good uh, virtualizing those. Okay, so they came out with that, and then uh, more recently, they released a beta for Service Pack 2. Service Pack 2 is the one we've been waiting for, um, doesn't fix all my problems, but they're doing some really neat stuff in Service Pack 2. In particular, in the last, um, I don't even know when it started, it just sort of creeping up on us. Um, but at some point, the packages that we were doing started having problems with VC runtime components. 
uh, both VC runtimes, uh, MS XMLs, uh, and uh, DirectX. Those are the three biggies. And basically, we needed to get them out of our packages. And I'm thinking it was probably actually a change to the .NET framework that brought this in because even apps that I knew in VC runtimes that I didn't have a problem in the past suddenly started having problems and AppV didn't really change. And it wasn't like it was overnight, it's just we noticed these things coming up and as we saw more and more of them we started to realize, hey, we've got a problem on our hands. And so we've been in this process in the last couple of years of every time we sequence something, we look to see if we caught one of those components and then we have to revert the machine, install the, the appropriate uh, VC runtime natively, and then capture the package and make sure that we treat that as an external dependency on the clients. So Microsoft is fixing that in SP2. Now we can just let it get in the package and they're taking care of the problem for us at the client. So it's handling the, uh, both the VC runtime and the MS XML. DirectX, yeah, we still got to deal with that one. But there aren't that many of those. Um, they're improving and giving us shell extensions. Now, I use two different terms for this. One shell integrations and one shell extensions. Shell integrations are things that ultimately result in an EXE running. So, you see a file type association, you get a right click, it's going to run an app. That's a shell integration. We've always had support for shell integrations. The shell extensions are COM objects that need to get loaded. So an example of a shell extension would be like WinZip uses a shell extension so that you can right click on something and say, hey, I, uh, this is something that I can send into WinZip. Um, often what's happening there is you've got a COM component and the non-virtualized Windows Explorer that runs your desktop needs to load that COM object. And because we virtualized the object, it wasn't available. That's why we haven't never had those. They now support that. So we let it get packaged and the AppV client at publishing times takes that as just additional information and does the appropriate integration for us to solve that problem. Um, they're also changing the way the, uh, the user interface stuff happens when you're doing publishing. So if a user logs into something like a Zen app server and they're getting all of their apps published, it takes a really long time right now and it's kind of horrible. We get what we call the uh, 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 stuttering start menu because uh, as every individual app gets published, the start menu goes away if the user happens to be going in there. So the user goes, oh, log in to go start program, oh, it went away, start program, oh, went away again, start program, win zip, oh, didn't get there, you know, and it takes a couple minutes to get that to settle down. So they're kind of cleaning that up a little bit. The other thing they're doing is they're supporting the new releases for uh, Windows 8 and 2012 beta. Just checking my time. Um, and presumably, therefore, I would expect because they don't tell us, this is great, they don't tell us anything about release dates, so I can just tell you whatever I want because I'm not going to violate an NDA. It's great. So my expectation would be we would be seeing a release when these guys get released, right? It, it, probably no more than like 30 days later, I would expect. All right, so that's being released probably what, fall? Yeah, okay. So probably fall. We'll, we'll see this. Um, I think it's um, becoming a really good platform. You know, we still have that, that little problem for people with roaming profiles where we've got all that stuff getting written into App Data Local. Um, we have some issues with um, in something like a Zen App environment that even when you remove the packages, there's a lot of crud that gets left around that we got to clean up uh, through some scripts every now and then. So um, just to plug a, a few things that I have for free tools in the AppV environment here, um, I do have a great guide for the VC runtime and MX XML problem. So if you're someone who is packaging, you want to go to my website, go to the tools page and find the link to the VC runtime and MX XML charts. Basically what you do is you sequence the app, you see, oh, I caught, oh, there's a, a VC 8.0.0. 2732.15, uh, because 15 is different than 23, um, and the chart will tell you exactly where the download is from Microsoft to get that particular version. So it, it gets that dependencies. Uh, I got a tool called AppV Manage that I use um, to debug the AppV packages right after I've sequenced it to test them out and uh, check them out quickly. Uh, these are all free tools. App Remediation was a tool to help solve the, um, all that data being written to AppData Local. 
So we can add this as a script in the new dynamic scripting capabilities of AppV5 and, and have that stuff copied into the roaming area when the app shuts down and then copy it back. Um, another solution a lot of customers are using are, are some of the user environment products like the AppSenses and the Reses and, and those guys as a way to, to take care of that. Uh, AVSS is a new tool. Um, I have a new version coming out here in another week or two. Current version does not support RDS or connection groups. Um, this is basically a self-service portal. Now, well, portal may not be the right word, but um, basically allows you to distribute the, app, the applications without the server infrastructure. All you need is a file share, an active directory, and um, it'll sync the two up and it can run in two modes. Uh, one mode is an automatic mode where it'll just do the publishing at the client level. Client logs in, it'll see, oops, who are they? What can I get at? They're supposed to have these apps and it'll do the publishing for them. Another mode, um, they bring up a, 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 a page, a little GUI uh, app that I have there, um, and they also pick and, and pick which ones they want from what they're authorized to have available to them. It's kind of like the old zero touch. Um, there's no workflow behind it for people to request apps or anything like that, uh, but hey, it's a free tool. What do you want, okay? Um, and then if you're running Zen app, um, even if you're running 4.6, the Publish from App V is an app that you want to maybe take a look at. It helps with the publishing process once you get an app on to the App V client of getting it into the, um, uh, the, the, uh, the Citrix database in terms of being a published app. So it takes care of taking care of the icon, uh, the fact that the uh, executable is SFT launch when you're talking about App V4 uh, and App V5. They're now, of course, native executables. Um, I am probably getting dangerously close to being out of time. But I think I have, ooh, I got five minutes. Ho, 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 ho. Huh? Uh, question. Yeah. Um, would it support a junction for app data so you could create a folder inside of there and junction back to roaming, even if you copy all the data? Um, it, it, it would. Um, the thing that we end up wanting to junction is um, it ends up under the users, app data, local, Microsoft, app v, package GUID, uh, not the version GUID. Okay, so package GUID is the one that you'd have to get. So you'd have to get the right package GUID. To, that's where the link would go, okay. the junction. Okay. I'll get you next. So where can you get your tools? Oh, yeah, 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 well, yeah that's not readable. <laughs> it's not readable. So uh, tmergent.com, tmergent.com is the website. Just look for the tools link, and then from there, um, these would be under the app V5 tools, all of these. <laughs> um, can I give you a, okay, the question was, can I give a good explanation as to why Microsoft is resistant to solving the, uh, the, the roaming issue? Um, and in, I, I, no, I can't. Uh, I can hypothesize. Um, to some extent, um, I find that the development team there is a little out of touch with reality of what goes on in the world. Um, we, we have been trying to do a good job of educating them as MVPs. <laughs> um, and they're, they're hearing us, but this is one that they've continued to resist a little bit. To some extent, um, they are correct in that there are anywhere near as many apps that have this problem than what there used to be. In fact, I was very surprised. When, I, when they first saw this and started complaining about it, um, I actually started taking a look a little more closely because it was, I was like, immediate was like, you know, this is non-starter. We can't do, do, live with this. But as I started looking at the kind of apps that we were doing for customers, um, there weren't that many that had the problem anymore. So the apps have gotten better over time. I think there might be some uh, level of resistance. I don't think this is intentional, but from Microsoft, the fact that, you know, Microsoft does a great job of supporting apps that are like really ancient over the years. I mean, they've, I mean, their platform general supports, I mean, I had a customer of this, uh, we just finished doing uh, an app, it was a 16-bit app, you know? Um, we had to throw it into a virtualized version of um, uh, DOSBox to get it to work on the 64-bit machines now. But, you know, this was a, a critical app that they still needed, um, and, you know, we needed to find a way to do it. But from Microsoft's perspective, there aren't that many of those, and they kind of like some of that stuff to start going away. Okay. Any more questions? Well, if there's no more questions, I'm going to give Benny my time. All right. Thank you very much. 
and I got everything. <laughs> All righty. Thanks, Tim, for the extra minute. <laughs> okay. Let's get started. Okay, everybody. Um, so I'm the one who stands between you and the party. So uh, I try to make it as entertaining as, as possible. So my name is Benny Trich, and uh, I'm a uh, RDS MVP, and I'm a CDP. And it's my 13th uh, Bry Forum uh, as a speaker. So I only missed one. And uh, so this session is going to be about creating or building demo environments. And actually, this session was inspired by uh, something that, that the Microsoft guys said when they, right before they shipped Windows 8. Because Windows 8 includes Hyper-V, client Hyper-V. And when we asked them, uh, what are, what are your intentions with client Hyper-V? Is it building secure compute environments on the client side? They said, no, 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 no. This is not what we had in mind with it. They said, clearly, it's for demo and proof of concept environments. Because we don't think that we can make it secure enough to really provide secure computing on a client, even though we have all this security hardware on most laptops these days. But still, we do not believe that we can make it secure enough. Um, so everybody was kind of surprised about that statement because there are other companies like Citrix, they made the statement that they have client hypervisors that were built to make, uh, to build secure environments. Uh, Microsoft did not have this in mind. So when I looked at Windows 8 from that perspective, I thought, hmm, how far can I get with that? And uh, I had several roles uh, in the past where I was responsible for teams of pre-sales engineers and consultants, and their daily job is going out and convincing customers either of products or of services. So demo or die, that's the statement uh, that I uh, do at, at that point. Because if you cannot uh, deliver a great demo of a new product or of a new idea or of a service offering, you may probably fail if you're on the technical side of things. So, it was about how can we build such environments and use Windows 8 Hyper-V and Azure to do that. So it's about client Hyper-V, it's about the Microsoft Hydration Kit that comes into the game, then using a tool to manage complete demo environments, and then adding Azure to the picture. The base platform is client Hyper-V, and there are a couple of hints I want to give you if you want to build great uh, demo environments. So, Make sure the CPU supports Hyper-V. Most CPUs do that. You should not start with less than 8 gig on your machine if you really want to uh, make a difference. Uh, those of you who did that kind of stuff in the past and demoed uh, from a laptop, they, they may be able to, to confirm that. Like <laughs> I know that Tim does that. And uh, so we carry around those bricks. Um, so we're the, the, the dinosaurs with the big uh, laptops. And uh, so that's why. And you should use SSDs. They are game changers, to be, to be very clear. Uh, the, the CPU performance and uh, memory performance does not matter so much, but disk performance really matters. It's the amount of memory that ma matters, and it's the performance of the disk that matters. Then if you have your uh, virtualized environments, make sure that your VMs have two uh, virtual networks attached to, uh, to them. An internal network that is only exposed to the, uh, to, to, to the host and the other VMs. And an external network that you can turn on and off if you want to update the machines, if you want to activate them, if you want to do fancy stuff. But you don't want to use the external network during a demo because you don't want to have some update happening during demo time. And the other thing is use dynamic memory. Um, so that, that are the basic things that you should do. Um, I will go through the Hyper-V manager in a minute, but there's another thing with the network. Um, the network configuration gets a little bit confusing if you have an external um, network connection, if you have a wireless LAN connection that is also available to the VMs, and if you have an internal network. So, you see, this is the typical setup that you will see 
after making all those configurations in uh, Hyper-V Manager. Uh, if you look at the local network uh, configuration, uh, don't get confused by that. Typically, every, all, all this configuration can be done from Hyper-V Manager. Uh, the only thing that you need to be aware of is please use some naming convention so that you can find out which network is responsible for what. So like uh, calling them internal or external really helps. Good. So if you want to build one of those complete demo environments, that may look like this one I have here. So here is my, my Hyper-V environment. CPUs, memory, hard disk, and so on and so forth. And here are my virtual machines. You see there are the two networks, and the external network has the connection to the outside. Sometimes I'm using the wireless network to, to make this external connection, and uh, it, it doesn't really matter which one you're using to make the external connection. The good thing is, even while the VMs are up and running, you can modify the assignment of the virtual network adapter to the physical available networks on your laptop. So if you find out, oh, uh, the wired network is not available for my external connections, you can just reconfigure uh, your VMs to use the wireless LAN without shutting them down, without anything. So it, it works uh, without any interruption. Good. So before we do that, let's take a look at how my environment looks like. And uh, I will demo that stuff in just a minute, but it gives you an impression what happens on my machine. Um, it's a quite powerful machine, so if you look at the task manager, you find out that I'm only using 10 gig of the 32 gig that are on the box, so I can add more resources, I can run more VMs. And just to give you an impression what it's like to use an SSD for that kind of uh, scenarios, I have a Win8 VM that I'm using for uh, the protocol testing that Sean and I do together. And if I go there and check out how big the, um, um, the disk is, it's uh, 25 gig, and it's got four gig of RAM assigned to, to this particular VM. Now, if I just start that one, So that's about the performance that you get on an SSD starting such a big machine. If you try to do that from spindles, it's going to take a minute or so. So that makes a huge difference if you demo. So only if you have SSDs, you can just walk to a customer, open the lid of your laptop, and start the VMs. And it's already impressive for the customer because you need to impress customers within the first minute or two. If it takes 10 minutes to start your demo environment, well, you really lost the good, imp the good first impression that you can make. So that's one of the, the, the golden rules of demo or die. Make a very good first impression. Good. So you see that the other VMs are still up and running, and I will be using them uh, just in a minute. Now, here's something that is called the hydration kit. Has anybody heard about the hydration kit? Well, one. It's, it's interesting, Microsoft works, it's, it's a Microsoft, it's not a product, it's like a collection of tools that they have, and they put them together under this umbrella uh, hydration kit. Because their idea is that you are able to dehydrate existing virtual machines after you build a reference environment. And so you use the dehydrated version of that demo environment, you deliver it, and then at the target, in the, at the target environment, you can just dehydrate uh, it, so add water to it, so that it is a, a complete environment again. So this is the metaphor that they're using for that. And uh, this is basically their internal demo environment or the internal kit that they are using to build their, their demo labs. And uh, so they have server uh, 2012 test lab guides, uh, and they're using those test lab guides to, buy, to build the hydration kit. Well, it uses uh, several Microsoft technologies in a very smart way. So this may look familiar to some of you if you go to the MSDN um, documents uh, or step-by-step -step guides 
um, that you find uh, at Microsoft. You will see that kind of environment. And this is exactly the environment that the hydration kit builds automatically. So the good thing is you can download the hydration kit if you have access to connect. So I have the links here. And uh, so Windows 8 hydration and Windows 7 hydration. The interesting thing is the Windows 8 hydration kit builds server 2012 environments. And the uh, Windows 7 hydration kit builds server 2008 R2 environments. So you would not expect to find server hydration kits under a client or workstation label. I will explain to you why they do it. And you see what technologies they use. They use Hyper-V with PowerShell. They use SysPrep and de Deployment Kit and Light Touch installation. What are they doing? They deliver a package. If you unpack the package, you have lab definition files. You have a PowerShell script. And you have two virtual disks. And those virtual disks, one is the server OS. And the other is what they call the hydration parent. It includes all the tools and applications that are required to build the demo environment. Now, you use an info path uh, method to populate the lab definition files, which is an XML file. The XML file describes your lab environment. So you can uh, tell this XML file, OK, I want to build 15 servers. And they have different roles. And all the base configuration goes into this XML file. This XML file is consumed by the PowerShell script. And the PowerShell script then creates clones or diff disks of these disks and modifies those um, uh, VHDs, those diff VHDs, according to the roles that they were assigned to. So at that stage, there is no VM created. Only the VHDs are manipulated. Because what they want to do is, after the VHD boots, they want to make sure that all the follow-up installation steps are already, for that particular role, are already injected into the virtual hard disk. So after that has happened, Hyper-V host is started. There are some role configuration files that are also consumed. And then the entire lab environment is built. Only servers, because we only have the server OS as a base image. Now, how does the client uh, come into the game? What they do is, one of the server roles is an MDT server. They inject the client OS in the tools and applications. And then the MDT automatically installs the client. So you can assign um, like four or five MTVMs that they are populated with Win7 or Win8. <laughs> this is how you, you build a complete environment. If you ever watch that, yeah, I can use my laptop to do that. You sit in front of your laptop and you watch it for two hours build an entire environment without touching it. It's fascinating. So to give you an impression how fast these things can be, I have extracted some PowerShell code. This is the PowerShell code that I extracted from the um, hydration kit. It's not, it's not too much if you look at, at the code. Now, what it does, it creates one machine. It creates a diff disk and boots the machine. Now, here, from here I can start the script, and here, we want to take a look at what it does. So just get it started. Just take a look at how fast it goes to create this new machine. Done. You see, there's a new machine, Win8 clone. It's already running, and it's booting. So it took like 10 seconds to create this machine and to get it up and running. That's all. Oh, yes, absolutely. It builds a domain controller. It populates a domain. The other machines wait until the domain controller is ready. Then they connect to the domain controller. They get assigned to the domain automatically. You watch that. So, and you can kill that machine. 
and it's no problem because you can just recreate it. So I can afford just say, nah, turn it off and just kill it, delete, that's fine because it's so easy to build a new one. Okay, but the challenge is, and you've seen it, I used the Hyper-V console and the Hyper-V console, well, I try to be polite. It's not the best solution you can find in the market. This is why most people started using third-party products uh, in order to use, um, well, if they want to really present uh, demo environments. And this is a reason why you find tools out there like, well, um, Royalty S or VRD but those were designed for administrators to administer their production environment. Now, it's not so good suited for demo environments and POCs. And this is why I talked to a developer who previously developed one of those uh, available uh, tools. And uh, I asked him if he can build a new, um, well, remote connection tool that is more optimized to, to, to play well with um, Hyper-V, RemoteFX, RDP, and with Azure. So combining all that. I wanted to have maximum real estate for the sessions. Uh, I wanted to have um, a simple UI. I wanted to be able to build environments so that I can uh, control multiple VMs at the same time as a group. Uh, credential management PowerShell support. And this is where this new tool is available. So for the first time, I want to uh, uh, introduce you to this tool. And uh, I, I do not run this company. It's not my company. So uh, it's, it's not something that, that, that I uh, benefit off. So I just asked the guy to provide that tool. Um, what you can do is you can either write me an email and you will get a free version of uh, the technology preview, or you can write an email to this uh, address, and the same is going to happen. You're going to get the, the, the free tool. I'm going to show you what it looks like, because I have screenshots in the, uh, in the slide deck, but I rather want to show you what it looks like in reality. So this is the tool. So you see the dashboard here. Uh, the beauty of the dashboard is you just click on one of those, and uh, you see that you just go, uh, it's a tapped environment. And you see, this is the environment that I presented to you at the beginning. It's, the, um, it's a, an entire RDS environment. So we got a domain controller, we got an infrastructure server that is responsible for the load balancing and the web, uh, the, the web service. And uh, I got two RDSH servers uh, that are load balanced. I got a Win7 machine that I can use to connect to. I can use my Win8 machine. Um, to, to connect to the, the uh, remote desktop session host servers. So that is the idea. You see that it's connected through remote effects because as soon as uh, that happens, you see uh, the network conditions like the, uh, the bandwidth and the latency. It's directly injected. Now, if I want to look at what this environment looks like, it's a visual overview. And the other good thing is that it comes, if I look at the environment, you see the entire environment. It has PowerShell scripts, which allow me to sort of manage this group of machines. So it's PowerShell script enabled. So the entire uh, object model of the tool is exposed so that you can use it from PowerShell. And as I said to you, you can either put the machines together in groups, and then there are environments, or you can look at them individually. And um, so here is that machine that I, that I, that I just started previously, the one, uh, the, the Win8 machine uh, that I started uh, while I was talking to you. So this is there. This is the machine that I use to do some reference testing for the remoting protocol stuff that Sean and I are doing. And uh, the other thing that I wanted to be able to do is connect to Azure. And if you look back, and I want to just show you that I have an Azure machine up and running. So this is my Azure account. 
And here's a server 2012 R2, and I didn't want to install it locally on my Hyper-V machine, but I wanted to combine the two things, the Hyper-V box um, for my standard uh, RDSH environment, plus I wanted to add the uh, server 2012 R2 to this uh, particular environment. So this is up and running. It runs in Europe. West Europe is the location. But still, I got a fairly good connectivity. And guess what? I'm using the wireless LAN like you do. And all of that is combined in the same user interface. So if, I, if, you, if you look at the configuration, so this is an Azure config file that I have um, particular for this machine. So I can connect from the same front end to my Azure instance of server 2012 R2 while running the other uh, server side by side. Now if I install the services that allow me to connect uh, on-prem and off-prem instances of Windows Server, I can put them together to demo environments. And the nice thing is that uh, Azure is also PowerShell enabled. So the next step is using the hydration kit to create machines on Azure and put together uh, entire test environments that are running either on-prem or off-prem or a mix like a hybrid environment. Um, we're still working on that. This is why it's still a technology preview of the, of the tool. So I want to encourage you to just write me emails, to just uh, download the tool, to just, uh, well, tell me if you're interested in doing the ki same kind of stuff. If you're doing POCs, if you're doing demos uh, uh, as a consultant or in your, in your enterprise environment, um, that should be something that you want to use. And uh, the idea is to provide that tool either for free or at a very low price to people from uh, the community. Okay, that was what I wanted to share with you because I want to make sure that we are able, as a community, we are able to build that kind of demo and POC environment, environments a lot easier than it is today. Even that Microsoft announced them and they said, hey, Windows 8 is made for POC and demo environments. There is no tool for that. There's nothing out there. So you're left alone. They don't even advertise the hydration kit. And that makes it really hard to build that kind of stuff. I hope that was useful information for you. Thank you very much, and it's party time.